Wilson. Thank you so much for joining me on the couch. Pleasure to be here. Tea with Jules. Obviously, I need to ask you, what is your favourite tea? At this time of the day, it's chamomile. So thank you very much for bringing out the chamomile tea bag. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the chamomile. I also really like English breakfast tea. I'm, yeah, I keep it quite simple. Anything more complicated than that can sometimes, you know, throw me. Okay, yeah. English mm. breakfast is my favourite yeah. of all the things to love. Yeah. It's my favourite, I love, always. A I love a really good pot of it with milk. And I like the process of kind of topping it up, adding more milk, and it'll take me half an hour to get through a whole pot. I yeah. love that. I love that you love tea. That yeah. makes me feel very happy. <laughs> and I take it you're not having a sugar in your tea no, today? No, no. You sure? Yeah, absolutely positive. Don't try to tempt me. <laughs> Can I have one? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to because today is an I Quit Sugar Day for me. Good, okay, it's just good to have one day. Okay. Yep. Now, you are, you're a bit of an overachiever, Sarah. I've been you're, around a while. <laughs> not that long. <laughs> you are a blogger, you're mm -hmm. an author, a New York Times best-selling author. You're a trained journalist, you're a health coach. Mm -hmm. You, uh, help me out, what else do you do? Oh, I've done some TV shows. TV host, you're a social commentator, worked in magazines, worked in newspapers. Mm -hmm. But tell me, how do you get from baby Sarah to Sarah Wilson, who I'm chatting with today? Take me back wow. to your childhood. In some ways, um, I get asked a bit about my upbringing, quite a, well, quite a lot actually, because people are trying to work out, well, how did you go from editing Cosmo to preaching minimalism to talking about nutrition, you know, um, and then having worked... I also worked in politics for a while when I was in my early 20s. Um, I guess it did probably start as a kid. Um, I'm the eldest of six children um, oh, wow. and I grew up in the country outside Canberra. It was not a country town. It didn't have a post office. It had absolutely nothing in fact but just sort of rocks and hills and uh, it used to snow in winter and it was scorching hot in summer. So I think in many ways it led to me being quite creative and very mm -hmm. outward looking. You know, Jules, you're from Adelaide. Mm -hmm. I and, am. Um, Country girl. Yeah, well, <laughs> not so much anymore. But I think that when you come from you know, a town that's not a big town, you're always outward looking. You're mm -hmm. always looking at what the rest of the world's doing. For me it was, I used to borrow my friend's dolly magazines and, you know, I was obsessed by everything that everybody else was doing because it sure as hell wasn't happening where I was growing up. <laughs> yeah, went to high school in Canberra, went to university in Canberra and um, chopped and changed from a law degree to politics to philosophy. Studied overseas for a bit, um, and then I got an autoimmune disease when I was 21. I ran myself into the ground. I was going very, very hard. I was doing mountain bike racing. Um, I was just working all different jobs, and you know, I was having a lot of fun. Mm. I've got to say, but then I just went too hard, and got um, Graves' disease, which is a thyroid condition. Um, at the time, I didn't know what was going on. Is it something that, because you were running yourself into the ground, that's why you got sick? Or is it something that you have and then it's, it comes out later in nobody life? Nobody actually knows. Um, there's a genetic predisposition, absolutely. My grandmother had it. Um, and then, uh, so you have that vulnerability, that genetic vulnerability. But in, it can be a virus that can send you over the edge. It can be adrenal stress. It can be a trauma. Um, it's basically just your immune system just collapses for some reason. It's pushed too hard. Mm -hmm. and in my case, it was a combination of things, but... It, you know essentially it was going too hard wow. and so I burnt out at big time and, and took some time out and uh, did a big flip moved to Melbourne became a journalist did my cadetship uh, my first job was as the restaurant reviewer for um, the Sunday magazine which was based down in Melbourne at that time I totally winged my way into that <laughs> job I was doing work experience and uh, volunteered to redesign their food and wine pages taught myself how to use quark which was the program <laughs> that everyone used at that time and um, the editor gave me the job. So um, not that I'm suggesting that every work experience student should go and rework the yeah, The more I talk to people, the more I find everyone's a fraud. I'm yeah, telling you, everybody so lies their way into it's being so true. wonderful. It's amazing. Oh, fake it till you make it. Everybody's faking it. And the sooner you work that out, the more you realise that your own fretting is is nothing to be worried about, you know? Um, and you know, you'd be the same, you get older and you sit in boardroom meetings and you meet these big important mm -hmm. business people and you suddenly go, oh my goodness, you have no idea what you're, you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I know. You know, I freak out all the time. Yeah, I'm a perfectionist and I've been that all my life. Mm -hmm. 
And at times I've kind of given myself a hard time about it. But in those moments, you're kind of grateful. So you got your restaurant job? Got my restaurant reviewing <coughs> job. And then I, I, I did my cadetship, you know, sort of to become a, a proper journalist and um, was a features writer. And I kind of moved on and then Cosmo came about. I moved to Sydney. I think I went through another sort of flip of I want more meaning in my life. Somehow I ended up at Cosmo, but um, I moved to Sydney and just started up again um, mm-hmm. with just um, sort of a couple of suitcases of belongings, and yeah, it 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 sort of led on to this sort of world. And I'd never actually read Cosmo in my life. I was not interested in fashion. Um, I arrived with my suitcase of Melbourne outfits, you know, sort of asymmetrical pockets and <laughs> flat shoes. I'd never worn makeup before, and. Um, yeah, I was really. Made You'd never worn makeup before. No, no. And then you got a job as the editor of a fashion magazine. I know. Then I ran myself into the ground again mm-hmm. and um, burnt my thyroid out completely, and got Hashimoto's, which is another form of thyroid disease. And um, I, I got a very bad case of it, and and was unable to walk or work for nine months. I was pretty much house um, bound, and um, that was a real you know, dark night of the soul or dark nine months of the soul Mm. um, of working out quite a few things and making a choice about, well, what did my life, you know, want to be? What did I want my life to be? Mm -hmm. And I should say in between all of this, I did MasterChef. So I hosted MasterChef. Yes. I'm very grateful that I was part of such a huge phenomenon, you know, and um, I'm still great friends with the three guys. But... um, yeah, it was, I found it very restrictive. And I think for women, and I'll say this kind of boldly, I suppose, but in Australia, um, I don't know that we've carved out enough strong roles for women in TV. I know it sounds like a cliche, but I lived that. Mm. I saw how perfectly sane, wonderful, balanced men with good relationships with women found themselves unable to um, know what to do with me, you know. Um, and I was I was employed to, to be on par with the blokes, mm-hmm. you know, to be tasting the food, being a judge and all of that kind of thing. And it just kind of segued into me being a, an advertisement break topper and tailor, you know. Right. So you... Wearing a pretty dress. Welcome to the top 50 of MasterChef Australia. This is your first big challenge. This is your first opportunity to show George and I what you can really do. You will be chopping onions. You will be chopping a lot of onions. And we'll be watching you close. So you started out as as one of the boys, I guess, like That's a judge on the I food. I was hired and, to do, yeah. Okay, and then turned into a more of a hosting role. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, look, I understand why these things happen and uh, it just wasn't going to be something I could continue to do. And I was older than the average person entering TV, you know. Mm-hmm. I was in my mid- late thirties by that stage, and um, I I had other things I wanted to be doing. You know, because uh, I, I think your body has a way of telling you totally. Look, there's something not right. You need to slow down. You need to rest. Yeah. You need to take some time yeah. for yourself, or whatever it is. Do, I'm the sort of person that freaks out and just goes to the absolute extreme. You know, if I'm feeling extra tired there's something really wrong with me. Yeah. I was like that. I then, though, had to realise, after nine months of trying to find answers, trying to find a cure, trying to, kind of, you know, trying to find a fix, and nobody being able to help, and I progressively got worse and worse. I didn't you know, get better till I really hit rock bottom. And I realised it was, it was <clears throat> I'd been going so hard that something had to give. And so my body actually said, right, we're going to collapse in heaps so that you actually can't go any further. And I'd been so um, defined by my body, by being fit fit and physical. It was the real thing that I was going to listen to. I could no longer be that person. So I had to redefine a whole range of things. And it really did make me stop and reassess things. And um, I had to learn how to live again Mm -hmm. you know and part of my experimenting was to quit sugar Um, I started writing a column for Sunday Life Um, one of my topics was uh, on um, you know I was short of a topic I thought I'll try quitting sugar my endocrinologist said you really need to do this your blood sugar levels are all over the place you're pre-diabetic I had cholesterol problems I had um, you know bone density issues like all kinds of issues so many things it was all related so um i started looking into it i thought i'll just try it for two weeks i don't have to stick to it and Mm -hmm. i was a total 
fraud of a sugar addict because I'd convinced myself that honey was okay and dark chocolate was okay and muesli and, you know, maple syrup muffins and all of that kind of thing, you know. Um, I was very virtuous, but I was eating 26 to 30 teaspoons of sugar a day, added sugar. I'm somebody who can't um, stick to rules. I've never been able to do a diet. I've never been able to. If somebody says, don't touch that, I have, have to, to touch, touch it. it. When I quit sugar, I thought, I'll just try it for two weeks. I don't have to stay on board. But I actually felt much better, and it just kept going and going and going. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah. I eventually moved to a, an army shed in the forest in, um, outside Byron Bay. So I was living on seven acres on my own in this old army shed. And um, I had one suitcase. I'd reduced all my possessions down to one suitcase. And I went up there and um, for a year and a half and lived on my own and surfed and gradually got better. Um, and it was up there that I started writing about and, and looking into the science of sugar and ringing experts mm-hmm. and emailing them and reading all these science journals and, uh, yeah. So getting back to your moment of quitting sugar and writing the book Mm. and putting it out there to the world I mean it's a very big thing to to say that you're doing this and then tell the whole world that that's what you're going to do was that a scary moment because I I mean it wasn't at the time because I had a very small blog audience and I wrote a column where I wrote about far more risque things um than um Quitting sugar. Yeah, but that was the one that really grew. shocked everyone. I really kind of, I've been kind of waiting for it all to kind of, oh, it'll end soon. But it just didn't. So it, So you released it in Australia first and then it just took off. It published as a print book in early 2013. Um, and then America and then the UK. And then um, it's now in 43 countries around the world. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. It's amazing. What does that feel like? A certain amount of... Um, comfort comes from the fact that I did something and it worked and that financially I'm okay and so it's kind of nice now to know everything's okay Mm -hmm. and so that's helped a lot with my anxiety but no I don't really think about I don't spend money on anything I don't own a car Mm -hmm. I you're a bike rider I ride a bike everywhere so you don't own a car you just own a push bike I own a push bike and I do car share Mm -hmm. um and I I don't really buy clothes. I've got clothes from when I was 18 and 21 that I still wear. You're kidding. I tend to wear the same thing over and over again. Really? Yeah. Do you think that's a, that's from how you grew up? It's laziness. Okay. I hate going shopping. Do you? It's the biggest waste of time known to mankind, I think. I just get to the weekend and I go, I probably should buy another pair of underpants. Oh, no, but what about shopping, shopping for food? Is that different? Because that's that. for your body. And you... It closes for your body. Yeah, and supermarkets are easy to get to and you don't have to browse and try things on. Yeah, there are you know? there are shopping people and there are not shopping people. Ironically, I'm a stylist, that's my job. Yeah. That's I work with clothes all, all day, every yeah. day. But I don't really like shopping. When I walk into a shop, I never work, try probably. I never try anything on. I just go from the front to the back, choose what I want and then go straight to the counter and hope for yeah. the best. I don't like owning things. I don't <clears> like <throat> consumption. And I guess that does come from my childhood. We didn't throw anything out. We didn't have a rubbish collection. Everything was repurposed. And that's how I cook. That's how I try to teach people to cook. Mm -hmm. I look at something and I go, look at the manufacturing that's gone into this, the resources, um, the the labour, and is it worth it? Do I really need it? Can I live without it? And the answer is always, of course I can live without it. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, This is a revelation to me. Is it? And I I actually get a real thrill out of going, well, what can I use instead of buying a brand new such and such? Mm -hmm. And invariably you find it. And you know, you're a stylist, you know what it's like. You're actually your most creative when you've only got a couple of things to choose from and you make a really cool outfit. You put so something true. incredible together when you haven't got much to work with. Yeah. And I find that, you know, it's the same with my cooking, it's the same with anything I do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whether I'm fitting out the office or whatever, I go, well, let's, let's work with what we've got. You should write a book on that. Well, I do. That's kind of what I do campaign about. I do, I do it in relation to food, so... A lot of campaigning around food wastage and yeah. cooking with leftovers. And in fact, my next print book is, is all about this. So that's out in October, so a few months to go. 
Great. Well, mm. I'll look forward to that. Do you have people just making confessions to you all day long, coming up to you saying, I just ate a piece of chocolate or I had a donut, that, that sort of thing? People say that. There's a lot of guilt surrounding it. Um, and I very much try to not operate from that platform. Mm-hmm. So do what you want. It's an invitation. The thing is, people say to me, but I love sugar. And I'm like, yeah. Um, but they say, no, but I really, really love sugar. I'm addicted to it. I couldn't possibly give it up. And it's like, well, that's because you're addicted to it. Mm-hmm. You can't conceive of life without it. Mm-hmm. You are on a blood sugar roller coaster where your whole appetite mechanism is dictated to, not by the hormones that actually dictate when you're hungry and when you're full, but by sugar, because sugar overrides that. It actually blocks that hormonal mechanism in the brain. The only food that does it, right? And we're designed that way so that we can binge and gorge on it because it's the best source of fat on the planet. And so we are designed to actually um, be able to eat huge amounts of it, not get full on it and be addicted to it because it was survival. If we found a few little berries or a little honey hive every now and then, we wanted to be able to eat it and eat it and eat it Mm -hmm. and get as much fat from it as we could. So it's completely understandable. And the only way that you can take control of that dynamic today when everything's got sugar in it and there's no ability to get away from it is to go cold turkey get it out of your system and see if you feel better i was going to say most people probably do feel better they do i mean look i don't like to put out pronouncements about you will lose weight i Mm -hmm. prefer to focus on people feeling more energetic having less energy slumps um, skin is something that most mm. people experience mm-hmm. um, in two weeks. It's the first thing that shifts is you get less wrinkles and less pimples. That actually is what kept me going after two weeks is my vanity. Give me, in a nutshell... What you need to do. No, just say to me, this is why you should do it. I would say that it is something that you... It means that you will never be able to sort of control what you eat or get back to that what I call food freedom while ever you're eating sugar. So... Remember as a kid, you used to be able to eat what you felt like. You'd get full and you'd stop eating. Yeah. And you didn't get fat. You mm-hmm. know, you just oh, ate what you needed. Oh, those are the days, yes. Yeah. So if you want to experience that fe- feeling again where your hormones recalibrate and do what they're meant to do, then get sugar out of your system. Also, if you're wanting to avoid... Um, the thing about quitting sugar, unlike other you know, pr- problematic foods like... Um, trans fats and so on is that you can actually reverse the damage so if you quit sugar today it's not like eating um, smoking tobacco if you quit today you can actually your body can actually recover now you seem to have it all Sarah you've you've got Mm. so many (laughs) things going on there's just you're a busy girl do you believe in the concept of having it all no I don't Um, and it's partly because I believe in the beauty of striving I actually think it's part of human nature to to always look forward Mm. Um, and I think that also um, having it all women have fallen into that trap in particular thinking that they should have it all yes and I think there's a lot to be said for making choices my example um, I can't have children and I'm 41 and you know that's something that's quite a a sad thing for me. Is that because of your autoimmune disease? It is part of my autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. Um, It's very difficult to get to have children Mm -hmm. and look who knows you might see me in 12 months time and I might be pregnant. I accept that it's very unlikely and so I don't hold myself back Mm -hmm. waiting for it to happen. Mm -hmm. I guess it is your angle and your view of what all is. Yeah I have what I have and um, I, I maximize that. You can have it all at different stages in your life. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had true love. Um, I've had intimate contact with children. You know, I was the eldest of, you know, a, a, a league of children. Uh-huh. Um, but um, so, yeah, you can have those experiences and they can be treasured and then you can let them go as mm. well and move on to other things. That's a beautiful way to look at it. Mm. I like that. Oh, I like good, it a thank lot. Thank you. <laughs> now, you're an inspiration to so many people. Who inspires you? Do you know, I, I always get asked this question, and it's such a hard one. I sort of think of Simone de Beauvoir or Joan of Arc, you know, those kinds of strident, mm-hmm. magnificent women who um, did ver- things that were very, very different to what was expected of them, and they, they had to be brave. I feel like you're that sort of a girl. Oh, thank you're you. You're a bit of a world changer. <laughs> it's mm. been very informative. <laughs> I've, I've enjoyed 
answering the questions. I like being asked, um, you know, meaningful questions. Yeah, well, I'm glad you joined me. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> High five to me. <laughs>